I'd like to just first start um, by showing you a scene from an area where cat hoarding has occurred. And I think sometimes it can be difficult to understand how conditions can deteriorate to something like this. And very often, hoarding can start with good intentions. An individual believes that he or she is rescuing animals and begins taking in more and more. Sometimes it doesn't always start with good intentions. That's variable. But oftentimes, individuals in the community and even other organizations might monopolize on this opportunity for feline live release and actually bring this person or individuals more and more animals. And over time, conditions deteriorate. So here's a, a garbage can that's filled with maggots. And cages go unclean because the capacity for care of these animals is very easily overwhelmed when their numbers grow. So one by one, cats that entered the facility healthy then become sick. And as you see these faces appear on the screen, these are really the, the victims of animal hoarding. And so now imagine, and probably you don't have to imagine because many of you have assisted with such cases, but that you're the veterinarian and you're being asked by local animal control or maybe the local police department to help assist with the sheltering and adoption of these cats. And so you can just imagine that the degree and the severity of illness, coupled with the fact that you know we're not really sure what pathogens are causing these diseases, um, what pathogens are common in, in cats from hoarding cases, it really complicates the sheltering, adoption, and placement opportunities for these cats. Very difficult to ask an organization to, to find good homes for cats that look like this, right? So just to, to break down the outline of today's talk, I'll be providing some background on hoarding, what it looks like, how it's challenging organizations across the country. And then we're going to shift into talking about a study that we conducted at the University of Florida that actually examined the records of about two, a little over 2,000 cats that were rescued from these large-scale seizures. And then we'll discuss um, what those cases look like, so four large-scale cases of hoarding. We'll talk about the cases themselves and then transition to the actual results um, of diagnostic testing, and then hopefully be able to issue some, some solid take-home um, points or some recommendations that you can take home to your shelter next time you're faced with the sheltering and treatment of cats rescued from hoarding cases. So just to start with a little bit of background, I'm sure most of us here are familiar with hoarding. Um, but I thought it would be worth mentioning that the accumulation and neglect of animals um, has become an increasingly reported phenomenon since the 1980s, and it's seen both domestically as well as internationally. It's unclear, however, whether or not this actual increase um, in the number of cases is due to an actual increase in the overall prevalence of hoarding, or whether or not we're just becoming more attuned to it and our capacity to respond to these cases is increasing. So that's, that's under, under um, debate. As we all probably know, the conditions of these cases are pretty horrendous, um, characterized by an accumulation of animal waste, um, dead bodies often will be scattered around the property or often in the refrigerator or freezer, um, garbage, as well as the associated elevated ammonia levels that goes together with the um, increased um, of uh, fecal matter and, and urine unclean litter boxes as well. Cases will frequently come to the attention of local law enforcement um, when individuals amass more animals than they can properly care for. And oftentimes it's the neighbor, a friend of the family, or maybe a family member that recognizes that the situation has gotten so out of hand that they're going to take matters into their own hands and actually um, take steps to report this person. There are an estimated 700 to 2,000 new cases of hoarding reported in the U.S. Um, every year, but this is probably a gross um, underestimate of the actual prevalence. It's actually estimated that up to a quarter million animals are victims of hoarding in this country every year. These are just new snapshots of a few of the recent cases from the last few years, and just take a look at the numbers of animals that are featured in these headlines. We have 697 cats, 700 cats, 400 cats. So these certainly are, are pretty massive, um, massive seizures. 
And certainly we see these becoming more and more frequent. So whereas a few years ago, um, the seizure of 700 cats, wow, that was you know, a really historical event, but now it's, oh, you know, another, another 600 seizure. And important to note also that animal hoarding can occur in a variety of facilities. So it's not necessarily um, you know, in someone's backyard. These can really hide under the facades of legitimate animal rescue and sanctuary operations. Hoarding is certainly a very complex behavior that results from a variety of psychological and behavioral deficits that really limits a, a person's ability to both care for themselves as well as care for the animals. And eventually, it appears that the needs um, of, the, of the hoarder become, or well, the needs of the animals become lost to the hoarder's need for possession of these animals. And approximately 25% of all new hoarding cases that are reported involve rescuers or rescue type organizations. And I'm certainly not by any means trying to give a, a bad name or a bad reputation to rescuers because they're really the ones on the front lines that are doing a lot of good. But it's just interesting to know that um, you know, uh, many of these organizations or these cases that we'll be talking about had very fancy and well-designed websites. I mean, you really wouldn't know what was going on unless you went on site and took a look at the the horrendous conditions and cruelty that took place. The pathological accumulation of animals was first described in the early 1980s, and animal hoarding was formally defined in the public health literature in 1999, and it was done using the following criteria. One, hoarders typically have more than the typical number of animals, and so that will depend, right, um, on the person in, in geographical area. Failing to provide even minimal standards of nutrition, sanitation, shelter, and veterinary care. And I think that's a, that's a big one. Denial of the ability, of the inability to provide minimum care. You know, many times these hoarders think again that, that they are doing good and that they are um, serving these animals well. And the persistence, despite this failure in accumulating and controlling animals, so even though there are dead bodies in the refrigerator and there's fecal matter accumulating in the bedrooms, you know, they are still, um, they are still doing these animals justice and it's okay to take in more and more and that's, that's very typical. So within the last decade, again, the phenomenon of animal hoarding has been, rec has been receiving increasing attention, um, increasing intervention by local authorities, as well as media attention. I mean, there's even a show on A&E titled Hoarding, which features animal cases. I mean, that's how mainstream this has become. But when we try to step back for a minute and ask the question, you know, just how big of a problem is hoarding, and try to assess the actual magnitude of the situation, it becomes very difficult. And for one, hoarders are typically socially isolated. And as a result, many of these cases go unreported and unnoticed. Similarly, there are often dismissive responses of both potential reporters as well as those that have the, these cases reported to them. Um, oftentimes, people will see the situation and clearly understand that you know, this isn't right, um, but they don't think it's their place to intervene, or you know, this is a friend of the family, and so they're not going to get involved, and so they turn a blind eye. And oftentimes, you know, we hear the, the opposite of that, that people do try to report but it seems to fall on deaf ears um, in terms of the, the authorities that it's being reported to. There's also a lack of legal investigative authority, and this might be one reason why um, agencies aren't very, um, aren't very interested in going after these cases. According to the Animal Legal Defense Fund, many states have no legal definition for animal hoarding, and courts already assign relatively low priority to animal abuse and neglect cases in general. And many people also are unfamiliar with the severity of abuse and hoarding situations. The high cost of caring for these animals rescued from hoarders, who often are, are cared for at the rescuer's expense. It's also a huge disincentive for prosecuting hoarding cases. These factors certainly contribute to a very lengthy and difficult legal process in securing a positive verdict in these cases. So as we move forward from here, I just want to be very clear that these cases and, and the, the results and data that I'm going to be sharing with you are from large-scale cases. So these aren't just your, your backyard, your you know, elderly lady who has 10 cats in, a, in her home or in a trailer. I mean, these are 
um, cases that involve hundreds and hundreds of cats. And these cases certainly required very extensive planning and there was a very high cost associated with these cases. In the largest cases, from the time of seizure, so from the time that the cats were seized, to their disposition, so whether or not that was adoption or euthanasia or transfer, these cases cost one to two million dollars. Um, so certainly no, no small um, expense here. And so easy to imagine why, you know, your local animal control, your local humane society, um, this really is outside their capacity um, to, to shelter and care for these animals. And so this picture truly exemplifies what I consider as large scale. Again, we're talking typically cages stacked on cages um, of animals. So because these cases can be so cumbersome and um, very costly, they typically require multiple agencies. And so uh, if a local humane society is called about responding to a case or to shelter you know, 100 or 200 cats, and, and that's outside their capacity, whether it be financially or, or staffing wise, They'll typically solicit um, the assistance of, of other regional groups or perhaps even national animal um, welfare organizations such as the ASPCA, Humane Society of the U.S., or American Humane. And regional, and, and we're very fortunate here in Florida to have really uh, amazing disaster response groups, and, the, and they will often deploy to help with these situations as well, not only with the seizure of these cats, but also with the sheltering and, and continued care. Very important to keep in mind also that these cats are, are not, um, do not necessarily get turned over in their ownership to the agency that's pursuing the seizure. So if you're a, a local humane society and you issue a warrant, um, that then goes through the court process and you might have possession of those cats, but you do not have legal disposition of those cats until they're actually officially signed over by the hoarder or the court awards legal custody. So you as a humane society or whatever organization you might be working with, may be stuck with these cats for six months, eight months, a year, a year and a half. I mean, so these are <laughs> can be very um, long-term operations. So just important to keep in mind. And then veterinarians are often solicited in these types of operations to help assist with not only the pre-planning um, phase, but also uh, medical triage. So doing intake exams of these cats as they um, arrive at whatever temporary facility they'll be held at. Um, or also in, in just administering daily care. And I just wanted to, to go through this briefly because this kind of describes what the whole process looks like from start to finish. Again, a lot of planning goes into play, so, um, and this isn't all done just by the, by the animal welfare organization. You know, this might be done by law enforcement. And so they will typically try to document the scene, document the cruelty, um, get enough evidence to actually pursue the case and obtain a warrant in court. Um, once that's been secured, um, then, then the planning really kicks into, kicks into gear because the humane side needs to start ordering you know, medical supplies. What will the, the long-term sheltering housing look like? Um, who will you know, staff this operation? So a lot of planning. And so then once that warrant is obtained, um, then the actual uh, day on site occurs, and typically law enforcement will go in first and um, potentially escort the suspected um, hoarder off site, and then a thorough crime scene documentation takes place. And for any of you that perhaps are enrolled in our um, online master's program at UF, you know a lot about documenting the crime scene and, and taking adequate photographs and making sure um, that you have enough evidence in court when that time comes to prosecute this person. After that's done, then medical triage will come on site and get those cats that really need immediate attention off site and sometimes we'll even treat them on site as well, it just depends. Important also just to mention that if you are planning on sending, you know, 100 sick cats to a local veterinary hospital, you might want to give them a heads up beforehand, um, but certainly without um, disclosing the, the information about the case. So then after the cats have been properly identified, then they're typically transferred to a temporary shelter. And that could be an hour, two hours away, um, really just depends. And then, that's, and then once they arrive at that temporary shelter, then they're like any other shelter animal arriving to a shelter where they typically will receive a thorough uh, intake processing procedure. And this is what a, an intake 
uh, procedure would look like, and they're typically done by teams of three, a veterinarian, uh, an assistant, and a scribe to record all of the physical exam findings. And remember, you know, this, these are all very important legal documents and legal findings that can be used in court. And so a lot of care and attention are taken um, in these intake examinations. But just think also about the time and uh, workload that it takes to do intake examinations on 700 cats, many of which are, are fractious. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. These typically will take days to perform. Local, locating a temporary shelter and securing a lease is certainly best done well beforehand. Um, a lease that is potentially long-term is very important um, because, again, organizations are forced to shelter these animals for months and months awaiting legal disposition. So, um, these are examples of what temporary shelters might look like. They can, be, they can involve warehouses, shelters, as well as fairgrounds. And this is uh, one from a case that involved almost 700 cats, and there was uh, multiple warehouses used in this operation. So these cases, again, involve both forensic and animal rescue components. And you know, best case scenario is that on site, the day of the seizure, the suspected hoarder signs over custody of the animals. Because then you can do, as an organization, you can do what you want with them. If you want to adopt them, um, you can treat them, you can um, transfer them to, to interested rescue partners. But if they don't and you have to pursue that legal process, then that's kind of worst case scenario. Historically, when we think about large scale cat seizures, um, they typically result in mass euthanasia, unfortunately. These cats are very ill. They've been living in overcrowded conditions with very, uh, and also very unsanitary conditions. Many of them are la uh, poorly socialized uh, because they rarely get human contact. Many of them are more on the, the feral um, spectrum of behavior. And there's also you know, a lack of space in our local shelters, our regional shelters. Certainly I'm um, preaching to the choir here. Um, but there's really not a niche market in many of these locations for, you know, barn cats. It's difficult to find placement for them. And certainly, you know, we're talking about the medical conditions. If any of you have taken in, you know, cats from these situations, you probably know that they're pretty sick. And they serve as a risk to other animals, both in your facility, in your shelter, as well as in the community. And a lot of these cats in these large-scale operations get transferred to organizations across the country that can take a few. Maybe you know, so a group in Seattle can take a few, and maybe Boston Animal Rescue League can take a few, just as an example. And so these cats are being disseminated nationally, and with that, they also take whatever infectious diseases they might be carrying. And certainly, their medical conditions dictate the ordering of supplies, the preparation of shelter protocols, as well as the eventual placement of the cats themselves. So that was some background just on hoarding in general. And now I wanted to transition into sharing with y'all um, the results of a study that we conducted at, at University of Florida. So over the past few years, our team at UF has assisted with multiple large-scale seizures of cats. And as a result, we decided to go ahead and examine the records from all of these cats um, to determine the prevalence of infectious diseases to help assist with the characterization of these diseases um, in cats with respiratory signs, with signs of gastrointestinal illness, and also their prevalence of retroviral infections. And, and the reason we did this really was for multiple reasons. Um, for one, we really wanted to help assist with response planning of these cases, um, ordering of supplies, development of medical protocols, whether or not uh, memorandums of understanding with local veterinary clinics would be necessary and also how the infectious disease burden might affect sheltering considerations. So if you were to take in 500 cats tomorrow, you know, would you need isolation facilities? What would the medical care necessary look like? And what are the adoption options for cats um, with varying um, clinical illness and clinical disease? So records were reviewed retrospectively from four large-scale seizures of cats performed by national animal rescue agencies, in which we were also a part of, um, from November 2009 through March 2012. In each case, veterinarians performed intake examinations and screened for infectious diseases as needed to help guide their treatment decisions and, and to isolate ill cats in the temporary shelter. So a total of 2,023 cats were enrolled in this study. 
And that was based on them having available intake data um, and as well as available diagnostic testing results for us to look like. All four of these cases involved um, facilities that classified themselves as, fe as feline sanctuaries, and they housed a combination of stray, surrendered, and feral cats. So intake examinations were performed on all of these cats um, on site, actually at the sanctuary in case one, or upon arrival at the temporary shelter, which was the case in cases two, three, and four. And as you can imagine, again, you know, performing intake examinations of 600 cats is no small task, and, and these exams certainly did take a prolonged period of time. Intake protocols did vary between the cases because they were run by different national animal welfare organizations. Um, so there were differences among the intake examinations in these four cases, but all of them included a thorough physical examination that documented each cat's age, sex, weight, and body condition score. Details of illness and or injury were also recorded primarily for forensic purposes, but also to guide medical decisions. Cats were photographed, vaccinated, treated for internal and external parasites, and blood was collected for retroviral testing. What I want to point out, though, is that testing for respiratory pathogens and gastrointestinal pathogens were primarily completed on cats that exhibited severe signs of these diseases. So not all cats received a respiratory PCR. Rather, it was done to guide treatment decisions of those cats that were ill. So if a cat came in um, on intake and it had severe blepharospasm and mucopurulent nasal discharge, it probably was sampled for, um, its respiratory disease would be noted, and then it would be sampled for PCR. And similarly with cats with, with diarrhea, if they had obvious, um, obvious, I'm trying to think, rectal prolapse or fecal matting, those would be sampled at intake for uh, gastrointestinal uh, pathogen PCR. But if severe diarrhea was noted within those first couple days after intake, then samples would be collected. So just important to keep in mind as we're going through that when I'm talking about the characterization of these diseases, I'm talking about the cats that were tested, the cats that had signs of disease, not necessarily all of the cats. In terms of serologic testing, um, cats were tested for feline leukemia viral antigen and FIV, FIV antibody with a commercially available point of care ELISA using whole blood. Testing for heartworm antigen was performed in the majority of cats seven months or older in two of the four hoarding cases. Diagnostic specimens from cats with signs of respiratory disease were collected using sterile swabs, and those were submitted for PCR detection of pathogens. Two samples were typically collected from each cat, um, one from the conjunctival sac and one from the oropharynx. Um, the respiratory PCR panel included the following um, pathogens that you see here that included feline herpes virus, feline calice, chlamydophila, bordetella, Mycoplasm, mycoplasma, as well as strep equi subspecies Zoe epidemicus, also known as strep Zoe. We'll certainly be talking about that a little bit later. And that was typically requested as an add on, and we'll talk about why that was added on later and also the importance of that. Fecal specimens, again, were collected either um, from rectal swabs or from litter boxes or cage floors from cats with obvious signs of diarrhea. Typically, a fecal specimen was sent out for both PCR and fecal flotation, um, but sometimes, again, depending on um, the responders present and veterinary, um, veterinary decisions, um, maybe one sample only went to PCR and another went to fecal flotation. But nonetheless, we um, analyzed the data that was available, and so on the IDEX GI PCR pathogen panel, we can see that those samples were tested for Trichrichomonas fetus, which we'll discuss is, is fairly common in cats from situations such as this. Excuse me, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, uh, Toxoplasma, feline parvo, feline coronavirus, Clostridium perfringens, Campylobacter jejuni, and Campylobacter coli, all um, potentially pathogenic bacteria. And then we have fecal flotation, your run of the mill. Um, fecal parasite infections that you're detecting for, ascarids, hookworms, whipworms, and coccidia. To preface the four hoarding cases as we move forward, all four seizures had 
a lot in common, many similarities in terms of their inability to provide adequate care for the cats, as well as the frank unsanitary conditions. I hope you can see the cat that's actually in that carrier living in there. So we can refer to these sanctuaries as failed sanctuaries as all of them were eventually reported to authorities, shut down, and the animals were seized. So this is case one. We'll go through these cases briefly. In November 2009, 594 cats were relinquished from a cat sanctuary in Florida following a on-site assessment that revealed very high rates of disease and mortality. The majority of cats had been group housed in indoor-outdoor wire mesh pens. Cats under treatment had been housed in a barn in plastic airline carriers, and that's where they lived. Following relinquishment, cats were examined and sheltered on site for several weeks pending disposition. 185 of these had to be euthanized because they were critically ill or because their behavior didn't warrant them as adoption candidates, while the rest, the remainder, found new homes. In June 2010, 387 cats were relinquished from a Pennsylvania cat sanctuary after an inspection revealed that cats had been housed in overcrowded and unsanitary conditions on the first floor of a two-story commercial building. The majority of cats were group housed, and that took place indoors. Following relinquishment in this case, cats were transported to a temporary shelter established at a nearby fairground for intake examination and they were housed there at the temporary shelter in stacked wire crates for several weeks pending disposition. And you can see the example of the um, temporary shelter there on the top left. In June 2011, 697 cats were seized from a cat sanctuary in Florida. This response was a joint effort between local animal services, HSUS, ASPCA, as well as the United Animal Nation. Cats had been group housed in both outdoor community pens, barn pens, as well as travel trailers, or in indoor wire crates, as you see here. Cats were transported after seizure to several air-conditioned warehouses where intake examinations were performed. Cats were housed there in stacked wire cages in the temporary shelter for approximately three months until legal disposition. Approximately 60 of these cats were euthanized. In February 2012, 696 cats were seized from a Florida, another Florida cat sanctuary. Um, the majority of cats had been allowed to roam freely outdoors with a few dozen housed in pens or in trailers that were designated for sick animals. However, even though um, the suspected individual um, in this matter um, attempted to segregate ill animals. They were certainly found throughout the property. Uh, movement of, un of animals was unrestricted in and out of these very um, these sick trailers. Cats healthy, cats were actually triaged in the field, um, and those in critical condition were taken to nearby veterinary hospitals for immediate treatment and stabilization. Cats that were healthy enough for transport were relocated to a vacant animal shelter where they received their intake examinations. And really interesting, interesting about this case also was the disparity between, you know, you might be looking at that picture in the bottom right and say, you know, I'm looking at a, you know, a heaven for cats, little cat community, but um, it was in very stark contrast to um, the level of disease and suffering that was found throughout, throughout the cats there at that, in that property. At the temporary shelter, so about two hours away, these cats were taken, um, and where a lot of pre-planning had, had taken place to establish this shelter, and cats were group housed there two to four to an indoor-outdoor dog run with a guillotine door. Um, um, or they were placed in individual cages um, if their medical condition warranted. So until disposition, approximately six months post-seizure. So now again, take into, take into consideration here, you know, 600 cats, almost 700 cats, um, sheltering, sheltered for six months, and many of them looked like that. This is a picture just of, uh, of um, the National Animal Agency going on scene to do some of the, the scene documentation before the seizure occurred. 
And this is a picture of one of the, the vans that was uh, transporting the cats from on site, so from the, the, the site where hoarding occurred to the temporary shelter. Now, just to recap, available records were reviewed from every cat from these seizures. So we're talking about PCR results, fecal flotations, intake data for over 2,000 cats. So it was quite the spreadsheet, as you might imagine. And so now let's delve into the results. So not surprisingly, um, clinically affected cats from all four large-scale seizures were found to carry a variety of infectious diseases. It's not unexpected given the large number of cats confined in crowded conditions, as well as the failure to isolate diseased cats from clinically normal cats. So we saw uh, most frequently um, severe feline upper respiratory infection, which I'll show you a few pictures of in a minute, severe gastrointestinal disease, diarrhea is frequently common um, in these situations, and it you know, accumulates everywhere. Um, dermatophytosis was quite common, as well as emaciation, poor nutrition. These cats, a lot of them were in poor body condition. The vast majority of these cats were adults, and in fact, less than 2% of all the cats that were taken in were kittens. And this may attest to the high kitten mortality rate, potential cannibalism, or infertility due to stress and illness. And there's about a 50-50 mix of males to females, and most of these cats were intact. Signs of upper respiratory infection were observed at intake examination in about 27% of cats for which records of physical exam findings um, were available. The proportion, though, in each case with signs of upper respiratory infection ranged from 16 to almost 40% of cats from, from a specific case had moderate to, to severe signs of respiratory infection. The majority of cats were infected with, on average, three pathogens on PCR panels, so there were usually some, some co-pathogens or multiple pathogens at play in these cats. So just to, to paint you a picture of what these cats might look like, um, note the severe mucopurulent nasal discharge. Often there's ocular involvement. Interesting to note also um, the ocular ramifications of the upper respiratory infections and a lot of missing eyes. So here are the results of the respiratory PCR pathogen panel. And we can see that the most common pathogens identified were feline Khaleesi virus and Mycoplasma felis. Um, those were surprisingly high. And that was followed by feline herpes virus, which was identified in you know, less than 40% of cats. Chlamydophila was then next in terms of prevalence, and then Bordetella was identified um, the least frequently. So feline Khaleesi virus was the most common viral pathogen detected in almost 80% of cats, surpassing the prevalence rate of feline herpes virus, which was identified in only about 33% of these cats. And feline herpes virus persists as a latent infection in cats and can recrudesce during times of stress. Now, as a consequence of stress and cross-contamination, we very commonly think of feline herpes virus as the main player in acute upper respiratory infection in our traditional shelters. And I think we've been taught that and um, it's common knowledge to most of us. But in stark contrast to that, it appears that cats that are um, living in these overcrowded, um, sanctuary-like conditions are more likely to be infected with feline Khaleesi virus rather than feline herpes virus. The high prevalence of Khaleesi virus among cats with URI is concerning for several reasons. For one, there's considerable strain variability in terms of its pathogenicity, transmissibility, and environmental stability. Not an easy bug to kill. And it's also associated with a wide array of clinical features, such as fever, conjunctivitis, oral ulceration, limping, gingivostomatitis. And the reason for this shift from high prevalence of feline herpes virus um, in cats in short-term shelters to high prevalence of feline Khaleesi virus in cats in long-term group housing situations is unknown. 
um, but it certainly warrants further investigation. So just to drive this point home, you know, in, in traditional shelters, we think of feline herpes virus, and we think of cats typically with mild to moderate signs of upper respiratory infection, maybe some serous to, to light-tinged greenish uh, nasal discharge. But then we look at cats in, in sanctuaries, and we see um, this kind of triad of diseases coupled with upper respiratory. Um, we'll see oral polyps and pododermatitis and a lot of gingivostomatitis. And could it be that feline Clesi virus is the source of the high rate of these chronic inflammatory conditions seen in hoarding cases? Not sure that um, we can say that with certainty, but it certainly begs to ask that question. In terms of mycoplasma, um, the role in upper respiratory infection is, is currently not um, completely yet defined. And most affected cats also carry co-infections, such as feline herpes virus. And, and that was certainly the case in our study as well. When we're talking about treating cats that uh, have clinical illness that can be somewhat attributed, attributed to this pathogen, um, there was a, a paper published in 2012 that looked at you know, the efficacy of using a 14-day course of doxycycline versus a seven-day course, and researchers found that um, the 14-day course did um, result in, in improved improve, in improvement um, versus the, the seven-day treatment course, although clearance of this organism wasn't demonstrated. And so it can be certainly tricky um, when trying to manage this, but typically occurs as a co-pathogen. Just to keep this image fresh in your mind again of the, the severity of clinical illness and upper respiratory disease in these cats, a very unexpected finding that we found when examining the results um, of respiratory panels was that um, the, was the prevalence of strep zo in these cats. 55% of cats tested with upper respiratory infection were positive for strep zo. And about 80% of those were co-infected with either Khaleesi virus or mycoplasma. So strep zo um, is known to be an issue in dogs, but rarely in cats. Certainly, if some of you have been coming to this conference you know, for several years now, you might remember that um, our respiratory expert, Dr. Crawford, actually gave a talk on this and its importance in, in its role in um, sheltered dogs. But so now we're, we're talking about looking at this pathogen in cats. And so strep zo, historically, has been known to serve as an opportunistic infection in horses, but is also considered to be an emerging pathogen in animal shelters, and has been reported as a causative agent in several outbreaks of fatal hemorrhagic pneumonia disease in dogs, and cats more rarely. Um, but in cats, strep zo has been associated with purulent nasal discharge, rhinitis, meningioencephalitis, and death, but the overall prevalence of strep zo in sheltered cats has yet to be determined. The common finding of strep zo in, large scale cat, in, in, these, in cats from large-scale seizures may explain in part why this URI is so clinically severe. And, you know, it's often deadly. Like, cats from these hoarding cases can die of upper respiratory infection, but when have you seen a cat in your shelter, well, I hope you haven't, um, seen many cats that actually, you know, are so severe to the point where they die uh, in a traditional shelter. So it could be that strep zo is an under-recognized cause of severe disease in cats. Since screening is not currently included for this pathogen in routine laboratory diagnostic panels, and the clinical presentation is much different in cats than the dramatic hemorrhagic disease that we attribute it to in dogs. And so one, you know, one thought to, is given, a thought can be given to perhaps using prophylactic antibiotic treatment in these cats. So while antibiotic therapy certainly should always be used judiciously uh, to avoid the development of drug resistance, Consideration should be given to the inclusion of antibiotics in the initial intake protocol at seizure due to the high prevalence as well as morbidity associated with this pathogen, strep zo. Convenia, we know, has been pretty effective in the control of fatal strep zo outbreaks in shelter dogs, 
because a single dose provides broad spectrum coverage, long lasting activity, and particularly in cats, it reduces the stress of handling, um, cross contamination between animals, and labor costs associated with dosing cats daily. It's also an ideal empirical treatment from cat, for cats from hoarding cases um, for commonly encountered conditions from cats, such as uh, wounds, pyoderma, otitis. But unfortunately, important to note that convenient just using it alone is ineffective against common bacterial pathogens um, that are associated with URI, such as mycoplasma, bordetella, and chlamydia. So that means if you're treating cats with URI, this alone um, probably is not going to be effective and you'd want to couple it with a drug such as doxycycline. A total of 68 um, fecal samples were tested for, um, by PCR. And a total of 95 specimens were tested using zinc sulfate centrifugation. And what we found here in terms of the, the diarrhea samples were that most specimens harbored multiple enteropathogens. It wasn't typical that a cat was suffering from just, just one uh, infectious cause of, of diarrhea. Just also wanted to, to paint you a picture of, of the um, fecal, situ fecal situation, for lack of a better phrase of it. Um, but what these conditions look like, and just imagine the potential um, for infection, also for reinfection. Um, of these pathogens. It's another picture here. So when we look at the PCR results, um, we can see that feline coronavirus was most commonly identified. We'll talk about the significance of that in a minute. Um, then followed by Giardia in about 55-ish percent of cats, followed by several um, potentially pathogenic bacteria, camp, um, Clostridium jejuni and Clostridium perfringens. Tritrichomonas fetus was identified in almost 40% of cats tested. Uh, Cryptosporidium was also detected, but at much um, lower frequency. We also had another pathogenic bacteria there, um, Clostridium coli, and um, feline panleukopenia virus was not detected in any of these samples. Looking at the, the fecal flotation results, um, Ascarids and hookworms were identified in 15% and 9% of cats tested. And this is much lower than prevalence rates that have typically been reported for outdoor feral cats in Florida. But this could be because in some of these cases, um, the collection of specimens occurred after the intake um, protocol was performed, and that included um, a deworming procedure. So um, that could have artificially uh, decreased our results of these parasites. Switching over to Tritrichomonas fetus. This was detected with very high frequency in cats from all four cases, with prevalences ranging from 29 to 50 percent of cats tested. Tritrichomonas fetus is a highly contagious causative agent of intermittent large bowel diarrhea in cats, but particularly so when cats are confined in these large group situations. The diagnosis, management, and adoption of these cats is very tricky and difficult in a shelter setting. It's often misdiagnosed with Giardia. Um, in this study, about 50% of cats um, were, co were found to co-harbor both Giardia and Tritrichomonas fetus. And currently, there's no real approved drug um, for the treatment of Tritrichomonas, and the response to therapy is variable. But in, in case four, when we found a, a large percentage of cats to be positive for this, and it also um, was correlate, directly correlated with their clinical signs, um, these cats were isolated and administered a recommended dose of um, ranitazole, 30 mg per kg daily for 14 days. And so any cats that uh, have this pathogen identified in a hoarding shelter or a shelter that's caring for these cats long term should be immediately isolated. These cats serve as um, potential sources of infection for other cats in the shelter. And after you're done treating these cats, uh, a repeat PCR test should be performed to assure treatment success. But unfortunately, regardless of the testing results, these cats really should be kept isolated until after adoption to minimize disease transmission. Because relapse of infection with this organism can occur as long as 20 weeks post-treatment. 
Giardia, as I mentioned before, was identified in 56% or so of fecal specimens tested. And this rate exceeds prevalences previously reported in shelter cats, both with and without diarrhea. Um, Cryptosporidium was also identified um, at a higher rate than what is typically um, thought of as being a, a normal level in cats with diarrhea. Um, coccidia, however, was very low. Um, and that can probably be attributed to the fact that there weren't many kittens at all. And so very low rates of that um, organism. But when we're talking particularly about Giardia and Cryptosporidium, really creates some management dilemmas in your temporary shelter. They're fairly environmentally durable. Um, there's a lot of potential for misdiagnosis of these um, pathogens, and there's a lack of practical curative treatment. We will be talking about tomorrow, though, um, an innovative um, solution, perhaps, um, a one-time treatment for Giardia. So stay tuned for that tomorrow at, at 3 o'clock. In terms of pathogenic bacteria that was identified, um, several uh, uh, strains of Clostridium were identified in the majority of cats. It's pretty ubiquitous. The clinical significance of this, however, is fairly unclear because, for instance, Clostridium perfringens can be found in cats both with and without diarrhea. So it's been suggested that actually the quantity of the um, Clostridium perfringens toxin A or CPA um, actually detected in feces might better correlate with diarrhea rather than the mere pre presence of the, of the pathogen itself. I mentioned earlier, too, that um, feline coronavirus was found in many of the cats that were tested, one of the, the most prevalent pathogens identified. And that's very consistent with previous reports that document higher prevalences in um, cats that are confined in, um, in situations such as this that share a common litter box. Viral mutations of this organism are concerning and can potentially lead to fatal feline infectious peritonitis, or FIP. Um, this is anecdotally reported to be more common in hoarding cats not something that we commonly identified. We did um, see a few cats, particularly in case four, that um, were, had a presumptive diagnosis of FIP, but didn't seem to be more common, but just something to keep on your radar. Now let's switch from respiratory and gastrointestinal pathogens to ringworm. And we probably all can agree that ringworm is an important consideration when sheltering animals from really any source because it's highly contagious, has zoonotic potential, and it certainly can be difficult to diagnose. Its management is particularly challenging when sheltering very large numbers of cats from hoarding cases because of its widespread prevalence in these populations. So data um, was collected from these cases, some better than others, and in cases one through three, there were well-documented challenges, I should say, with the management of ringworm. There was documented transmission both to volunteers, to shelter staff, as well as to other cats. Very difficult, um, particularly when, we, when we're talking again about hundreds and hundreds of cats. So in case four, um, a very well-concerted effort was made to try to identify infections proactively, so identify potential infections at intake take steps to mitigate the risk of transmission, and really halt in shelter transmission at that point. So all cats, as part of the intake protocol, were screened for ringworm at intake, um, both in room light, so just in the natural light, and then in, um, in a bathroom, in a trailer, where these exams were taking place with the woods lamp. And I just also wanted to, to pause here to say that there is recent evidence to suggest that we no longer have to allow a woods lamp to warm up. I think historically we're taught, you know, 10 minutes minimum, go turn on the woods lamp. But now we understand that we can actually just turn it on and it's ready to go. So cats that, were, that exhibited um, signs suspicious of ringworm were immediately segregated on intake and put in separate housing. Their skin lesions were cultured. Um, and they also received 
a lime sulfur dip. And not just the cats that um, had clinical signs, we're actually talking about all cats. So all 697 cats went through this station. So as you can imagine, nobody wanted this job. Like nobody wanted to man the dunk tank. And so, uh, and keep in mind that, you know, 20% of these cats are fairly fractious. And so this required some sedation. So while the actual effect that this practice had is difficult to quantify, it's certainly believed that this preventative measure dramatically lessened the transmission um, of ringworm throughout the shelter. And so the reason we did this was twofold. One, we wanted to just go ahead and decrease the spore burden. So let's dip all these cats. There's also um, some thought given that lime sulfur might actually have a protective effect, and I'm not sure that this has been well quantified, but um, perhaps this also will infect, hopefully not infect, will also um, prevent um, these cats from, um, from becoming infected while they're at the shelter. So in case four, 11% um, of cats had ringworm-like lesions on intake. And those were cultured, and about 11% of those were positive for microsporum canis. And then throughout the next couple weeks, um, and a few additional, a few is in 45, cats also were noticed to develop skin lesions. And so whether or not these were missed at intake um, or what happened is, is unclear, but those were cultured, about 35% of those. So some of those might have just had a reaction to the topical antiparasiticide, um, but about 30% of those cultured positive as well. So all of those cats were placed in an isolation ward and were begun on a treatment regimen, including twice weekly lime sulfur dips as well as oral terbenafine at 30 mg per kg once daily. And then there were also repeat weekly cultures to help guide their treatment decisions and to assess uh, the success of treatments. And this protocol is actually pretty effective in eliminating infections in the majority of treated cats. And uh, this certainly was also coupled with the use of appropriate personal protective equipment as illustrated um, there in that picture of gowns, gloves, and booties. And certainly, um, you know, no treatment can truly be effective without consideration given to environmental cleaning as well. You know, one key fact to remember is these spores don't multiply in the environment. They don't invade buildings. And so the daily removal of debris and organic material will minimize environmental contamination. And so we use um, Wizzy Wash at the temporary shelter in case four, and that's a, a bleach-like derivative product that can be attached to an end hose sprayer. And so it's pretty effective when you're talking about um, run, dog type runs or hallways. Um, but certainly uh, the historical one to 10 bleach dilution can be used, assuring adequate 10 minute contact time. There's some thought given to the use of accelerated hydrogen peroxide yet, but I think that the jury is still out. And again, assuring that contact time is important. So now we'll transition a little bit into retroviral testing. Um, the sanctuary managers from all of these four cases assured us that all the cats were tested for retroviruses and were appropriately segregated based on their serological results. However, retroviral infections were identified um, in each of the facilities in all areas. So certainly these cats were not appropriately segregated, and they were often group housed with uninfected cats. The retroviral prevalences of these cases um, surpasses infection rates previously reported for both pet and feral cats. So um, we found that when we looked at all of the data um, and took the, took the mean of that, on average, um, the feline leukemia viral prevalence is about 8%, as well as the FIV prevalence as well, 8% also. And the reason that this is higher could be several reasons. Um, for one, these cats could have been dropped off, um, already positive. So perhaps uh, a local shelter had some FELV cats that, you know, they didn't have any placement options for, and they heard about this great sanctuary that would take them. And so, you know, it could be that these cats were relinquished with these infections. But it also can be attributed to the sheer physical contact, stress, and agonistic interactions between these cats living in these densely populated confinement areas. But it also might lend some evidence to in-sanctuary transmission as well. So all cats should be retroviral tested at the time of seizure from hoarding cases. 
as the retroviral status of these cats will influence housing decisions, so whether or not you co-house them or individually house them, um, their medical care, as well as their adoption options as well. Um, cats should also be retested two months. So if you have these cats for more than a month, two months after the initial test, you should go ahead and repeat another test to identify early infections that may have escaped detection at the time of intake. So we have all this data. We've characterized you know, the respiratory and gastrointestinal pathogens. We've looked at their um, retroviral statuses and, and their ringworm burden, but, but what does it all mean? And, and you know, how, do we, how does it change what we do? And I can't really emphasize enough the need for well-developed, pre-thought um, pre of protocols. Um, the planning of seizures of, ho of hoarding cats doesn't involve just calculating costs. Um, protocols must be written to determine the intake protocols for these animals. So again, taking into consideration that um, these cats are pieces of evidence, and so documenting them forensically is important, but also documenting their medical conditions. And that lends evidence for how you're going to treat these cats. You know, again, easy to treat 10 cats with URI, but not easy to treat 400. And so when we're talking about, you know, those intake protocols, they really need to be comprehensive because it's very hard to go back after the fact. It's very hard to say, you know, shoot, cat number 459 really needed its ears cleaned, and now I'm going to go try to find it in the shelter and do that four days later. Like, that doesn't happen. And so if you're planning on, let's say, implementing a convenient injection at intake, like, that needs to be done at intake because it's very difficult then to go back and try to find all those cats. And that's what happened in case four. Um, we started testing cats for respiratory pathogens and seeing all these, it, all these cases of strep zo. So we called IDEX to confirm it. So, you know, can you make sure these are right? And can you, all the other PCRs we sent you, can you please go back retrospectively and look at those and see if they're positive for strep zo? And all these cats started, um, you know, we started getting all these positive results. And so then we had to go back after the fact and try to administer convenient injections of 700 cats. And it's really um, no small task. So making sure your intake protocol is very robust and very comprehensive. Then sheltering considerations also, feeding, cleaning. And you always need to anticipate staff shortages. Like, you will never have enough people um, even just to clean and feed. And so certainly, you know, when we're talking about having enough staff for medical considerations, like, it sometimes can be hard to just clean the cages. So when we're talking about, you know, what does a robust intake protocol look like, it includes some of these things. So it includes a comprehensive deworming protocol with pyrantal, panazeral, praziquantel. There's also a topical um, form profender you could use. And synictazole, which again is coming tomorrow at 3 p.m., um, so I don't want to give too much away, but this could be uh, an interesting addition to an intake protocol. Four, cats that are four weeks of age or older should receive um, a modified live vaccine with feline panleukopenia virus, feline Khaleesi virus, as well as feline herpes virus. Cats also should receive a rabies vaccine um, that are 12 weeks of age or older. Vaccination against FELV um, should be initiated at intake, particularly if cats are to be co-housed, um, to help reduce the risk of continued transmission from cats whose infections might have not been detected immediately on intake. The appropriate administration of uh, ectoparasiticide is important as well, but the lime sulfur also takes care of a lot of, a lot of those um, bugs that might be on the skin as well, so handy for that as well. Um, microchipping these cats, again, at intake um, can really help uh, decrease the staff time needed to microchip them at adoption or at the end of the case. And then again, considering an empirical treatment such as convenia um, for, many, for addressing many of the commonly uh, encountered conditions in cats found from these types of hoarding cases. Um, treatment protocols for individual diseases are also important. And, something that you might want to give consideration to because in these large-scale cases, um, there's not always going to be necessarily the same veterinarian on site. And so to help assure treatment consistency, no matter who the veterinarian is or who the staff is, like you have an actual protocol that says, you know, if a cat has, um, you know, diarrhea or a cat has a alopecic lesion, um, this is the protocol that you follow and making these readily available to staff when they rotate in and out. 
Um, dosing charts can also be uh, a help as well in these cases. This is a typical organizational chart for staffing considerations for these cases and very similar to the incident command structure ICS that many of you might be familiar with. And these cases kind of run the same. Um, there's multiple branches, an operations branch, so that's the day-to-day -day on the ground activities. We have logistical considerations, um, admin finance, so how we're gonna fund all of these activities that we're doing in the shelter, and then planning. And so what can be a culture shock to some veterinarians is that they fall pretty low down um, on the ICS structure under operations. They are not incident commander. They are not in that orange box. And so again, you know, as veterinarians, like we like to be in charge of things, but that's not the case. Veterinarians in these cases typically have a very defined, albeit very important, very important role, um, but it's certainly, it, it's limited in scope and, and defined. Typically after the end of these cases, so once legal disposition um, is granted to the organization that's caring for these cats, they'll put out a call for either a large mega adoption event, um, such as was the case in Jacksonville um, for 700 cats, or um, they'll try to solicit um, rescue partners from across the country um, to see if they're interested in maybe taking a few of these cats. So not uncommon that many of these cats are literally distributed nationally. And whether cats are discharged from temporary shelters directly into new adoptive homes or to another shelter for eventual placement, complete records of their examination findings, diagnostic results, and treatments administered should be transmitted with that cat. Um, and also very helpful is a summary of findings for the population as a whole. So, you know, providing that veterinarian that's 2,000 miles away with, hey, you know, we had a lot of Tritrichomonas fetus and 80% you know, of the cats are positive for a wingworm. Like, I just want to give you a heads up. Maybe tell them that after they've agreed to, to take the cat. But um, so just making sure that they're aware and that, you know, they're aware that, you know, if you're sending them a cat that was treated successfully with trichomonas fetus, it's negative now, but it's going to need, you know, retesting and it will probably need to be isolated at that shelter that it goes to. Like, making sure that um, you're in frequent communication um, with, those, with those veterinarians, with those facilities. Because the high carriage rates for persistent infections in these cats, such as Tritric, um, you know, those are difficult to diagnose and eliminate, and they certainly uh, make them a risk for uh, introducing new pathogens into their facility. There's certainly available funding um, for emergency relief efforts if you're ever um, confronted with the potential for responding to one of these cases. Um, this is just an example from PetSmart Charities, which will actually pull up a large size tractor trailer onto the property with about $70,000 worth of supplies, crates, bowls, et cetera. Um, Petco also has a similar emergency grant, um, emergency relief grant that's available. Just wanted to step back to, um, we certainly have a lot of, we've shared a lot of in, in interesting information, but it's, there are certainly some limitations of the study that, that warrant discussion as well. You know, this was certainly retrospective in nature, and so there were limited records um, available. And the quality of records certainly were um, variable among cases, and even among um, medical staff and veterinarians that might have been at, at each case, even on a day-to-day -day basis. And so <clears throat> there were also, in terms of sampling, um, you know, a lack of very systematic testing. Every agency, every veterinarian had their own um, indications for perhaps performing that PCR panel or that fecal flotation. And so it's difficult to comment on the actual prevalence of disease in all cats rescued from hoarding situations. And furthermore, cats were only sampled at one point in time, so just a snapshot. And differences in disease latency and duration of shedding dramatically affect the detection of disease. Um, so we really have to exercise caution in extrapolating the findings of this study um, to all cats that we rescue from hoarding cases. Uh, this paper, so hopefully this will be coming to um, the veter or a copy of the veterinary journal near you in a, a special feline infectious disease issue, which hopefully um, will be, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Dr. Lister, will hopefully be um, becoming available sometime this summer. And so this will have all these results kind of well characterized and um, recommendations um, well summarized for your use. 
Also, um, for your viewing pleasure, if you're interested, there's a poster um, right next door that also summarizes um, the results of the study. So there's a lot of resources out there. If you're interested in learning more about hoarding, um, certainly there's a lot of grant money available. But also, I encourage you to visit the Tufts University Animal Research Consortium. Um, that's just an amazing wealth um, of resources uh, available on hoarding. Animalsheltering.org has some interesting cost templates. So if you needed to um, perhaps present to your board or, or your director um, some um, a cost analysis, you can actually plug in how many cats, and it'll give you, you know, how many bowls and crates and things like that that you might need. And also, uh, I'm sure probably the majority of you are familiar with this, but University of Florida has partnered with the ASPCA to offer um, a very rigorous and intensive um, veterinary forensic sciences program. So it's very exciting. Um, I completed my master's in forensic science um, at the University of Florida, but at the time there wasn't a veterinary forensics degree. Um, so mine is more human related. And so very exciting that you know this is such a, a new field and and one that I would highly encourage you to take a look at if you are interested in these, if these types of things really interest you. So we're coming to the end, and I wanted to discuss now, so what are the practical takeaways? Like, like what are the major points here that we've, that we've learned through looking at all of these sick cats? First of all, um, a well-planned and resource intake protocol is more likely to result in comprehensive and consistent care than a less thought of protocol um, that relies on routine treatments to be provided at a later time. Very important for that intake protocol to really cover the majority of things that these cats need. It's just very hard to go back. It, it might take days for you to get an accurate inventory of even where these cats are. You know, again, if you wanted to find black cat number 694, it's really difficult, and that takes days and days to establish, and so um, hard to go back after the fact, and so really devoting some time to sitting down and, and writing protocols ahead of time. Similarly, think about treatment protocols for all conditions um, that you might see in these cats. So if you see, you know, um, ear disease, if you see otitis, if you see ear mites, like there should be a common protocol because, again, you might have vets from across the country coming to help and they all have different clinical judgment, some, you know, better than others. And so you really don't want to come back to the shelter after being back, after being gone a few days and you're, and you're wondering why this cat has been changed to, you know, uh, an antibiotic that you don't really uh, necessarily think it's the best treatment for that um, disease. Give consideration to lime sulfur dipping all cats in sulfur, in lime sulfur on intake. Really may help to decrease the overall dermatophyte spore burden in the shelter and also help to reduce in shelter transmission. Four is that strep zo is likely an underrecognized cause of severe disease in cats. And so consideration should be given to the inclusion of antibiotics in the intake protocol due to the high prevalence and morbidity of strep zo in cats from large scale hoarding cases. In contrast to traditional shelters, cats from sanctuaries are more commonly infected with Khaleesi virus rather than herpes virus, and this certainly um, may lend evidence to the increased um, prevalence of those chronic inflammatory conditions like polyps and pododermatitis. Once your organization obtains legal custody of these cats, they're often disseminated nationally, and so really uh, give thought to sending complete records and give special consideration uh, for their management. Some more references, and I'd also like to thank Ogena Solutions, who generously sponsored this session. Thank you, everybody.